Well, this morning we're taking a break from the story. If you're just a guest joining us, we've been on a, we're on a year-long journey through the story, through the Bible, and uh, this morning and next week we're taking a little break for Christmas, uh, even more so for Advent as we focus in on uh, the coming of God to us. I'm not going to read this right now because we're going to read it as we go. So Thomas, you can either stay here or skip it, uh, whatever you want to do. Let's pray as we uh, spend our, uh, focus our time. God, I just pray that you'd be with us now as we look at your word and as we reflect on what Advent is and what it means and what we're meant to be doing during this season and during this time. God, we've already confessed and know that we're forgiven by you. And, and part of our confession this morning is that at Christmas, we become so incredibly busy doing all sorts of different things, and we become so occupied with those that we often miss really what it's all about, that, and that it's all about you coming to us. And we're so thankful we don't only get to celebrate that at Christmas, but that we can celebrate that each and every day as we reflect on who you are and what you've done, and that we get to be partners in that coming as we then bring your word and your love to the world. So God, I just pray that you'd speak to us loudly and clearly now. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I have a question as we start. Advent means coming, that we're expecting someone to be coming. And that person, of course, is Jesus, that we look forward to him coming to us. And I'm curious this morning, how many of you were expecting snow this past week? Who was expecting it to snow? Okay, lots of you were. Okay, how many of you were ready for the snow? Like winter tires or boots or mittens or scarves? Okay, way fewer hands. Okay, so even though we kind of knew this was coming, we were like, nah, I don't need to get ready. Or uh, I was talking to someone before this service who, who said they didn't have winter tires on. They got stuck at one spot, so they tried to find another bridge to come home on. They got stuck on that hill trying to get up. Eventually, they stopped to help someone else who was stuck. So he's helping push this other car up. And she says, hold on, I've got chains. They try to put the chains on, but she's prepared, but they're the wrong chains. They don't fit her car tires. And so then he says, well, hold on, I'll buy these chains from you because I'm stuck too. So then he pushed her up the hill and then put his chains on, his new chains he bought for $20, and off he went. Often we're expecting things to happen, but we're not actually really prepared for them. And that makes me think of Jesus coming 2,000 years ago, because from essentially page three of the Bible, from Genesis 3, God is telling people, I'm coming. There's a Savior coming, and this Messiah, this anointed person, the Son of mine is coming to rescue you. And they have thousands of years of preparation. This is my question. Do you think when Jesus came, people were ready for him? No, we don't get that sense at all, do we? We get this sense that some people had stopped waiting and looking, that they weren't even expecting Messiah to come anymore. Some people thought, well, it won't be a savior, it'll be a, a politician, like that would ever rescue us, right? Or, I mean, they're expecting it to be a king, or they're expecting all sorts of different things to come. But when Jesus comes, it seems like there's a lot of confusion and a lot of shock and surprise. Could this really be the guy? All these different questions are raised as Jesus comes, even though they've been told to look and wait for him for thousands and thousands of years. And so this morning, we're going to look at four pictures that Jesus gives to us, and we're going to work through our reading now. And we're just going to go through this, actually, I think three times this morning, as we just think through what did it mean then, and what does it mean for us now? Uh, so this is uh, our reading from Luke. Starting at verse 25, uh, 35, it says this, Be dressed and ready for service, and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet. Yeah, great. So that, when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It would be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready even if he comes in the middle of the night or towards daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Jesus gives us four pictures there. The first one is this, be dressed and ready. Be ready for action. And in Greek, it's more closely to this, let your loins be girded. 
How are your loins this morning? Are they girded? It's interesting. What is this ta- what's kind of this mean? Well, it, 2,000 years ago, everyone would have been dressed more like I dressed for the first service, right? With this long robe. And you can't run around in a robe. You would have to hike it up, right? If you wanted to get anywhere quickly, if you wanted to be dressed and ready for action, what they would do is they'd hike up their robe and they'd tuck it into their sash so that it wasn't draped around their feet and they weren't stumbling or tripping on it. They'd hike up their robe. As Jesus here says, hike up your robe, uh, lift it up, get ready to run, get ready to move, get ready to act quickly because I'm coming. And it kind of makes sense if you think, well, if I want to do something quickly, I guess my bathrobe isn't the, you know, the most efficient. We don't see Usain Bolt ever running down the track in a robe. He always wears something more appropriate. Jesus says, be ready for action. Make sure there's nothing interfering with your movement. The next picture Jesus gives us, these all come really quickly, is this one. Keep your lamps burning. Uh, again, that, I think that makes sense. Keep your lamps burning. What time does it get dark here in Cloverdale now? Too early. What time is it? I think 5 o'clock, something like that? 5 o'clock, it's pitch black out, maybe 4.30. But it's never actually pitch black, is it? Because we've got all these street lights down the streets, or if it gets dark, you probably turn on your lights. You don't just stumble around in the darkness. It's never really totally dark. I live here on the property. There's lights on. There's a red light flashing over here. I don't know why, flagging in Jesus or whatever that might be for. But it's never really totally dark. But again, if you back up 2,000 years, it'd be totally dark. When the lights are out, they're out. You can't flick on a switch. You have to have a lamp burning. So Jesus tells us, keep your lamp burning. Why? Well, so if you need to get up, you can see where you're going. Or if someone comes to the door, if some guest arrives, you're ready to welcome them in. You can see what's going on. Be dressed and ready for action. Keep your lamps burning. The third picture is a picture of servants who are awaiting their master's return from a wedding. Jewish people knew how to celebrate. Okay, so we go to a wedding today, and it's at Newlands Golf Course, and there's some great food, and there's a couple hours of dancing, and then we shut it down. Everyone goes home. But that's not how they celebrated. They would celebrate for days and days, sometimes seven days, a whole week, they'd celebrate this wedding. And so when a master would leave, he, he wouldn't know how long the party would go. He would just say, be ready when I get back. Well, how do, how do you be ready when he gets back? Well, you make all the servants, you have this watch uh, schedule where someone would stay up from 10 to 2, and then someone else would get up from 2 to 6, and then 6 to 10. So that you'd always have somebody up watching and waiting for the master to return. And then the fourth picture he gives us is the picture of the thief, a thief who comes to break in. Jesus says, if the homeowner had known when the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. He would have been ready and waiting. If you knew exactly when someone was coming to break into your house, would you be ready? They phone you up and say, I'm planning a break in 8 p.m. sharp. Right? Would you be prepared for that? Yeah. Yeah, you'd be right. You'd have the police there waiting, or you'd have, uh, I don't know, the, all the lights on. You would have phoned the neighbors. You'd have a bat or something. I, you'd be ready and waiting to stop the thief. Jesus says, be dressed and ready. Have your lamp going. Make sure someone's standing. Watch. And, and watch out for the thief. Make sure you're on guard. And the point of all four pictures is the same. Jesus gives us a summary at the end. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. There was a young couple who were set up on a blind date and uh, they'd never met before, but the girl knew a bit about this guy. And this wasn't going to be a dinner at Wendy's and a movie. This was going to be something elaborate. He had already let her know that he had booked the finest restaurant. And after dinner, they were going on a, a midnight cruise so she was thrilled. So she goes out, she buys a, a new gown that she's going to wear. She has some new makeup. She has her hair done. She is all ready. And at 7 o'clock that night, she is by the door ready for this big date. But he, the guy doesn't show up. So 15 minutes late, she says, okay, she double checks her hair, double checks the makeup, but he still doesn't show up. At 7.30, she's on the couch. She's just flipping channels, watching a bit of Wheel of Fortune or whatever's on. He's still not there. 
8 o'clock, she's got Sleepless in Seattle on. She's tearing up a little bit, eating some ice cream and feeling sad for herself. 8.30, still not there. Puts on her pajamas, puts on a facial mask. She's got the whole tub of ice cream now. She is weeping with Tom Hanks, right? And all of a sudden, there's this knock at the door. She opens it up. There's her date. And he says, what's going on? I gave you an extra two hours to get ready. We might, okay, as a bit of a groaner, wah, wah, wah. You know, we might look back at the Old Testament and say, now, why weren't these guys ready? They had thousands of years looking forward to Jesus coming. But let me ask you this. Are we today any more prepared, do you think, than the Jewish people were 2,000 years ago? I don't really think so. I don't think, I think that a lot of people, just like they did, I think a lot of people have gotten weary in the waiting Right? And if you wait long enough, and if you don't keep it at the forefront of your mind, you just stop expecting. So the point of Advent is to remind us again, hold on, something's coming. Something big is coming up. Jesus is coming. We need to be prepared. We need to be dressed and ready with our lamps burning. We need to be standing guard, and we need to be watching out for any thief that would come and cause problems for us. We have to be ready all the time. That's hard to do. But is it impossible? I don't think so. How many of you know someone, or maybe you have a severe allergy to some, something? Anybody here have a severe allergy? Okay, so what do you have with you in case something happens? Benadryl, says my four-year-old daughter. <laughs> ben- <laughs> We need, we need to move the medications. An EpiPen. People that have a severe enough allergy will carry an EpiPen all the time. They don't, go to, they don't go somewhere and say, ah, I probably won't encounter any shellfish today, or ah, no one will have peanut butter around today. They don't risk it. They always have their EpiPen. They are always ready for that emergency, for that time when they need to be ready. Jesus says to us, get ready and stay ready. So this morning what I want to do now is I just want to go through that same passage, but I want, uh, you guys can do the rest of the sermon. I'm going to give you one of the phrases, one of the pictures he gives us. I want you to talk in a group of two or three or four. Don't whisper. In the first service, everyone whispered, and then it's just awkward for everyone. Okay, it's like we're in a library or something. Just talk in your normal voices. Get into a group and just talk with a few people about what these things mean for us today. How do we do these things? So the first one is be dressed and ready for action. What's Jesus saying to us today? I'll give you a minute just to talk about that with some people. Be dressed and ready for action. Okay, that was great. What, okay, shout out some answers. How do you get dressed and ready? How do you gird your loins in preparation for Jesus coming? What's that look like? Shout it out. You talked so well as groups. Read, we, the Bible. read the Bible. Okay, what else? Pray. Okay, what else? Keep your pants by the door. Someone said, what if I'm in the shower? That's irrelevant. That's irrelevant. How else do you get, how do you be clothed and ready? Pardon me? Give up the Bible for Christmas? Give him the Bible for Christmas. Okay, okay, what else? What else? Forgive. Okay, these are all good ideas. Some of the things that this made me think of are this. The, the Bible talks about sin as something that so easily snares and entangles, almost like you're tripping in your robes, right? You're not running the race that you're meant to be doing. I think one of the ways that we get dressed and ready for action is by leaving all that sin behind. And the only way we do that is by going back to Jesus, confessing our sins and having him forgive us like we did this morning. But don't get tangled up and ensnared and tripping over your sin that holds you back. Uh, be forgiven. Be running free. Okay, uh, let's talk about the next one. What does it mean to keep your lamp burning? I'll give you another minute. What's it mean to keep your lamps burning? Okay, what do we got? What do we got? Show us some answers. How do you keep the light burning? Share, worship. Okay, what else? Practice. Practice. Okay. Okay, practice what? Practice sharing your faith with the family so you can 
Okay. Okay. Okay, I like that. Ken says, practice sharing your faith with your own family so that you're ready to share it with strangers. Okay, anything else? Any other ways you keep your lamp burning? From the balcony. Any ideas up there? Okay, Bible study. Lots of those same things, right? What I like about the lamp image is that a lamp isn't just for you. You don't just light a lamp and it's for you. You might, but it's also meant to give light to everyone around. I love when we baptize someone, like when we just had a, a baptism last week for Bentley. We go up to the Christ candle, we light another candle. I was saying, this is meant to remind you that Jesus, the light of the world, now lives in you. And then we go scatter into the world, and we're all meant to bring our light. That all comes from Jesus, and share it with the world. We're not meant to hide it. We're meant to share it, to put it up on a stand so that everyone can see. I like that idea of keeping your uh, light going, your lamp lit, so that you keep on trusting in Jesus. And we trust that the Holy Spirit does that inside of us, this flame of faith that we're supposed to keep on fanning into a bigger and bigger fire. But also that's meant to warm and light the path for other people around us. Let's skip one and let's go down to the thief. How do we get ready for the thief? Or how do we prepare for the thief? I'll give you another minute to talk about that. What's that mean for us? Okay, let's start here. Who is the thief? Satan. Satan, the devil? Okay, right. And so how do we prepare uh, to prevent the thief when he comes? What do we do? What's that look like? Put on the armor of God. Put on the armor of God. Okay, we arm ourselves with, uh, yeah, with the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, breast, breastplate of righteousness, feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel, belt of truth, all those things. Sure. Okay, what else? Use your power of discernment. Okay, we don't have to walk through the world just blindly trusting everything that comes along. We can pray for wisdom and discernment. Absolutely. What else? Avoid temptation. Absolutely. Again, we don't have to just blindly walk into things. If you know there's something you struggle with, stop going there. Oh, man, I always sin when I go to Rusty's. Stop going to Rusty's or whatever it is. I mean, why do we do that? Why would we keep walking in the same things? I'll go to Rusty's with you if you want. Okay, what else? Anything else? <laughs> Anything else? What else can we do to be ready when the devil comes? Okay, yeah, anticipate the unexpected. It's so interesting in our Christian life that for some reason in North America, in this uh, Christian way that we kind of work in, we kind of have this expectation that once you're a Christian, oh man. Happy street, right? I am inside, outside, upside, downside, happy all the time, right? Do you know that song? Just so good. I became a Christian. Money's just pouring into my bank account now, and my house doubled in size, and my wife is just loving me, and my harem of a dozen kids, they're all great and in line all the time. It's strange we have this idea that, oh, once you're a Christian, everything's just so good and easy. Where on earth do we get that? Uh, Just look at any character in the Bible, and you'll find affliction and pain and struggle. Look at Jesus. You'll see this very great guy, God himself, uh, arrested, betrayed, beaten, ignored, you know, bad mouth, eventually crucified. If you want to kind of decide which is Christianity more like, it likely points more to Jesus than it does to, I don't know, sparkling teeth and a big bank account. It's strange that we've done that. We need to be ready and prepared because we know, we should know that he's coming. And what does the thief come to do? Steal your joy, kill your faith, and destroy you. Not just hurt you, uh, not just drain your bank account, not just to give you a challenge in your marriage. Destroy you, absolutely wipe you out. We need to be ready and prepared by doing all those things we've talked about, being in the Bible, wearing the, the armor of God, all those things in the Bible, in community, in worship. When somebody stops going to church, the chances of them maintaining a thriving faith just diminish so rapidly because we need one another to keep fanning the flame, encouraging each other, building each other up, praying for one another, all those great things. I want to talk about the last one. Uh, you know, a couple other things. We can resist the devil, right? And he will flee from you. Uh, yeah, by having all those things ready. Just Bible verses ready to call to mind, just like Jesus did when he was tempted. 
Let's talk about this last one. How can we be like servants waiting for the master to return? I'll give you one more minute just to talk about that. Okay, how do we do that? How do we be servants who are ready for the master to come? Shout out a few answers for me. What's that look like? Be prepared, okay. What's that look like? Being ready for the master to come. What's that look like? Okay, sharing the love of Jesus. And you guys were talking, I could overhear, you're talking about doing the things you're supposed to be doing, right? Like whatever your task is, your vocation is, whatever your position is, be doing that well, uh, just anticipating that Jesus is coming at some point. Okay, anything else that you guys thought of? Work together, okay. Anything else? Glenn. Yeah, hey, enthusiastic service. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men. Be pouring everything you've got into it. There's a couple of things I love in this idea. The first one is this. Jesus might not come on your watch. Jesus might not come on your watch, so you need to make sure the next person's ready. And they're watching. They would divide the night into three shifts. But the master might not come on your watch. But if the next guy after you fell asleep, it was, there was a consequence for you. You needed him to be ready, which means, as, I think as a church, we all need to be ready, but not just us, our children, right? Because he might not come on my watch. He might come during Silas's watch, or maybe he won't come during Silas's watch. I need to make sure that Silas is ready to train his kids, or Summer is ready to train her kids, or you, your kids are training their kids because we don't know when this watch is coming. But we know that when the master comes, we need to be ready for him, dressed and ready, the lamp lit, ready for any temptations or sin or thieves that will come, and ready for the master to return. I love that idea that, man, it's not just about I'm ready, but is everyone ready? Is is the next shift ready? Are they keeping watch with us? And there's one more thing I love here. I want to read just one more verse for you from here. It says, It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. This is all good news. When the master comes, it's good news for those servants who are watching. Because he takes off his robes and puts on servants' clothes. He comes and, and serves them and feeds them and cares for them. He says, oh, take, take my chair at the table. I'm going to get some food. You guys have been working hard. You've been up all night. I'm going to take care of you. Don't we see that so clearly in Jesus in the Gospels? He says, I didn't come to serve, to be served, but to serve. I came to prepare and be ready and feed you, people that are hungry, to give sight to those who are blind, to heal those who can't walk, to give speech to those who can't speak, to calm the storms for those who are terrified of the storms. Jesus came to serve us, and when he comes again, even though it will be drastically different, and we'll talk about that next week, even though it will be drastically different, he still serves us by saying, come on in. Everything that I have done for you has been attributed to you. My Father has given you His approval. You've been clothed in my robes of righteousness. Come on in. The kingdom's yours. We've prepared an incredible banquet for you. Here's your seat. Even still, God comes. When He comes again, He comes and serves us by bringing us in and by bringing everything that He started in the beginning finally to completion. As you go through Advent, may you let that light shine. May you have your eyes focused on Jesus. Each one of those things hinges on Him. How do I make sure I'm ready? By making sure I'm not tangled up in my sin. I do that by going to Jesus, confessing and hearing His words of forgiveness and life to me. How do I keep my lamp lit? By going back again and again and again to Jesus and saying, man, my my, my faith has been struggling. I've been wrestling with this. Build me up. Encourage me. Fill me with your spirit. Let's keep this flame burning. And one of the great ways we do that is by sharing it. You know, like when we have a Christmas Eve service and we light some candles, it just takes one candle. And from that one, thousands of sparks can be passed on. How do we make sure we're ready? By resisting temptation, by, by just turning the devil on his heels when he comes to us, and being ready and making sure the next, next shift is ready. It's my hope and my prayer as we go through these next couple weeks of Advent, 
that you are standing watch, and that you're sharing the light with all the people around you. It's my prayer that as we go through Advent that you see it's all about Jesus. And as you go into Christmas that you'd see it's all about Jesus. Think about your plans for Christmas. Are they about Jesus? Or is something else taken center stage? And how do we get it back so it's all about Jesus? May you be ready, dressed and ready, lamp lit, standing guard when Jesus comes. And may we all together as a church be excited and filled with excitement and anticipation as we look to that day and say, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for your word that's living and active. And even though Jesus spoke these words 2,000 years ago, that they're so relevant and true for us today. Even if, even if we don't still use lamps, or even if we don't still have servants, we can still get the message that we need to be ready. God, help us be ready. Help us to stop being tangled up in the same old sins and just be set free by you and live free in you. Help us to keep our faith going. We know that there's doubts and challenges and fears and questions and obstacles and barriers and all sorts of different things that will come up, but help us keep that fire of faith lit and going. Fill us up with more and more of your Holy Spirit and give us a desire to be in your word more and more and to be with other Christians and, and wrestle through issues of faith together. God, help us be ready when temptation and the devil comes. We know that thief and liar is coming. So help us have our eyes open. Help us be discerning and know when it's his lies and his voice. Help us to block him out and only listen to you. And God, help us be faithful servants of yours who are actively telling others about you, about your goodness and love and grace for us and who are training up the next watch. Lord, we pray for our children, whether they're here or not. Lord, may they please be ready. For our grandchildren, whether they're here or not, may, may they please be ready, Lord. May you help us to pass this faith on to them. And God, as we head into Advent and to Christmas, as we're surrounded by it, but so many people don't know what they're celebrating, Lord, help us to share the truth about Christmas. That it's all about you and your gifts that you bring to us. God, I pray for each person here that you would fill them up to overflowing with peace and love and joy this Christmas. If this is a challenging season for someone, I pray that they would be surrounded by people who love them. God, I pray that you'd help us to invite people into the empty chairs in our houses and to celebrate this good news with them. God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather as your children, and we pray together the prayer that your son Jesus taught us.